Hello. Hello, everyone. Good evening, everyone. We will start the event. Please kindly be seated. I'm Meme Rado, Assistant Professor at Bar Graduate Center. On behalf of my colleagues, our Director Susan Weber and our Dean Peter Miller, I would like to welcome you to tonight's Francois and George Seitz lecture on 18th and 19th century French decorative arts and culture. This is the 19th year of this ongoing series, which has allowed us to bring an exceptional group of specialists to present their research and have conversations with our students, faculty, and broader intellectual community. French art and culture are not narrowly defined by a geographic and national boundary. They are constantly in dialogues with other cultures' arts, and in many ways, nourished and enriched by these exchanges. This evening, we have two distinguished speakers, John Finley and Crystal Smantic to give a lecture duet on intercultural exchanges between France and China in the 18th century. The format is new to our set series. We call it a duet as Finley and Smantic come from different academic backgrounds in Chinese art history and French art history, respectively. And they developed individual research following different intellectual paths. Yet their projects on the movement recontextualization and transformations of Chinese objects and images in France intersect with each other and offer complementary views. Finley and Smantek's work exemplifies the new wave of global art history that shifts the focus from territory-bound cultural characters to the networks and interconnections in the early modern world. Both their works draw a nuanced model of the commensurability between France and China and the multidimensional exchanges, buttressed with sensitive analysis of objects and primary evidence. Their work deeply resonates with the interests of many of BGC students, faculty, and the regular sets lecture audience. We are very pleased to have them here in this special format of pairing lectures. Our first speaker, Dr. John Finley specialized in Chinese painting and prints of the Qing Dynasty. He's a researcher affiliated with the Centre d'études sur la Chine moderne et contemporaine in Paris. Prior to it, Dr. Finley served as a Chinese art curator at Brooklyn Museum and Northern Museum of Art in Florida. For many years, he has been working on Ohibiatang a prominent French statesman and Sinophile, and his collections of Chinese objects, which culminated in this groundbreaking book. On Hideo's Town and the Representations of China in 18th Century France, published in 2020. Finley's lecture today will draw from this publication. Over to you. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to excuse me, this uh, outrageous piece of self-promotion and self-publicity. <clears throat> it won't go on long. Um, I would like to thank the Bard Graduate Center for inviting me and Crystal Smantek to make presentations in the Francoise and George Sells lecture duet, China and France in the Intercultural 18th Century. This evening, I would like to briefly explore the historical subject of exchanges of images, texts, and ideas between France and China in the context of the career, the biography, and the Chinese collections of Henri Bertin. These encounters began in the mid 17th century, but reached a peak of importance in the late 18th, in late 18th century Paris, and Henri Bertin was a key figure in those events. Oops. In seeking to learn all that he could about China, Henri Léonard Jean-Baptiste Bertin truly sought to improve France based on Chinese models. Bertin's official career lasted from 1753 to 1780, when he served, most importantly, as a minister of state <clears throat> under Louis XV and briefly Louis XVI. In 1764, two Chinese Christians who had been sent to France for ordination as Catholic priests 
Alois Gall, and H.N. Yang applied to Bertin for passage home on a ship of the French East India Company, which was part of his ministry, um, giving Bertin the idea of employing them as correspondents who would report on China. As preparation for Gao and Yang's new role, Bertin delayed their departure for one year and provided them with technical training in the manufacture of such things as tapestries and porcelain in the various royal manufacturers, the official studios and workshops in Paris and the surrounding districts that produced goods for the court and the French state. <clears throat> they received training in the sciences and mechanics, as well as instruction in drawing, so that they compare and provide information in detail on the differences between the two nations. Arriving in Beijing in 1766, Gao and Yang were taken in charge by the French Jesuits, the official Mission Française de Pékin, thus establishing the missionary's direct contact with Bertin. Taking advantage of this unique set of circumstances, the king, Louis XV, and Bertin also sent an extraordinary selection of gifts to the emperor of China with the goal of establishing equal mutual exchanges between the two great nations. <clears throat> In 1742, at the Salon du Louvre, François Boucher, a distinguished member of the Academy of Painting and Sculpture and well known for his tapestry designs, exhibited eight oil sketches, of which six would be reproduced as tapestries, called the Salon de Tenture Chinoise. The registers of the Royal Manufactory of Beauvais contain an entry dated 11 March 1763, noting, and I quote, six examples of the Chinese set to be delivered to, be delivered to Monsieur Bertin to send to China. End quote. And the six tapestries would be the most remarkable of the royal gifts. Indeed, the order for the tapestries as gifts to the Chenlong Emperor had been planned in some form before Bertin was able to take advantage of Gaoyan's request for return voyage to their homeland. It was, in fact, the regular practice each year for the king to order a set of tapestries to be delivered to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for presentation to the various courts of Europe. And it appears that here, China was to be the beneficiary of this, this sign of French royal favor. Among the designs, the painting we're looking at here, La Foire Chinoise, the Chinese fair, shows a scene of a marketplace with two figures on a stage, along with a woman in a wheeled chair, shaded by a large parasol and pushed by a servant, various figures in elegant costumes, examining goods, a view of a city gate or an archway modeled in a Chinese structure called a Pai Lao, and a distant pagoda. Bertin had anticipated the difficulties in shipping the complete set of gifts from Canton to the port city of Canton, the port city of Guangzhou, to Beijing. The story of the tapestries after their arrival in China is documented in the letters exchanged between Bertin and Father Michel Benoit, the superior of the Jesuit mission in Beijing. In fact, on their arrival in China, the gifts from France were seized by the governor general of Guangdong who refused to allow them to be sent to Beijing. Through a series of complex negotiations, it was finally determined in communications between the Governor General, members of the Council of the French Compagnie des Indes, the French Jesuits, and officials of the Imperial Court that the tapestry, tapestries would be transferred to the Jesuit missionaries to be sent to Beijing. They would then be presented to the Chenlong Emperor, not as a gift from the King of France, which would identify Louis XV as a vassal presenting tribute to the emperor, but as a present from the missionaries. The tapestries are certainly the most important of the gifts from France to China, or what was said also included a total of 18 porcelains from the royal manufactory at Sèvres, including vases, potpourris, and a number of figures after designs by Boucher and Jean-Baptiste Oudry. Two of the porcelains, identical to the potpourri vases we are looking at here, were included in Bertin's order in the archives of the Sèvres Manufactory, dated in September 1764, which describes the turquoise blue background color and the decoration with figures, the two scenes in chinoiserie style that appear on these vases. All of the French gifts to China, which included scientific instruments, two gold watches, books, and, I quote, Geographical charts, maps of Paris, the Louvre, Versailles, and other royal residences, which will give an idea of the magnificence of the king, were specifically intended to inspire an interest in China for the arts of France. A, a document dated 16 January 1765 
contains Bertin's instructions to Gowan Yang, and it included an abbreviated list of the royal gifts. Bertin added a long annotation in which he repeated that it would be most beneficial for both France and China if the emperor, the nobles of the court, and the nation should develop, <clears throat> excuse me, should develop a taste for the arts of France. This is a critical goal that Gao and Yang should never lose sight of, and in future, they will be sent descriptions of French merchandise and detailed price lists for French products. It is interesting to note here, I think, that the two most prominent gifts, the Beauvais tapestries and the Sevres porcelains, both depicted chinoiserie images, fantasy scenes of China, while the rest of the gifts represented traditional French technologies and culture. I do not think that these chinoiserie images have the same implications or of superficial or frivolous imitations of China that we now tend to see in them. Rather that, if Bertin or the king thought about this aspect of the gift, they would represent accurate portrayals of the Faro's empire. The direct contact <clears throat> with the French missionaries in Beijing began what Bertin would refer to as the literary correspondence with the French mission in Beijing, the responses to his requests for de detailed information on Chinese civilization. Father Michel Benoit wrote to Bertin in October 1766 from the French Jesuit res residence in Beijing and described in detail the difficulties that awaited Gao and Yang in their new, in their new lives in China. He promised, however, that the Jesuits would work to fulfill what Bertin had requested. In fact, Gao and Yang sent a significant number of letters and articles to Bertin, but what the French missionaries themselves would send was truly unprecedented. Bertin's extraordinary correspondence with the Jesuits provided the material for the 15 volumes entitled Mémoire concernant l'histoire, les sciences, les arts des Chinois, that is, articles on the history, the sciences, and the arts of the Chinese, published between 1776 and 1791. The Mémoire concernant les Chinois represent Bertin's most active and successful effort to disseminate the knowledge that was sent to him from China, including texts that presented both translations of key historical Chinese writings and detailed reports or articles, memoir, on current affairs in mid-Qing China. Engravings based on Chinese visual sources of the various volumes depicted many diverse subjects, including a richly illustrated Life of Confucius, published in 1786. They reflected a contemporary fascination with the evolving and sometimes contradictory portrayals of the great Chinese philosopher. Here we see plate five, showing Confucius as a child with his playmates imitating a formal ritual. The commentary the, to the plate notes that the scene takes place in a typical Chinese garden with elaborate rock works in the garden and a view out into the countryside. The artist, Isidor Stanislas Helman, has effectively translated the original Chinese illustration into a European visual mode with modeling and light and shade, cast shadows, and linear perspectives. Although few of Bertin's original letters to the missionaries in Beijing have survived, from their replies and the documents they sent to Paris, it is clear that Bertin returned a number of times to the question of Chinese architecture. Architecture as a concept was very much on the minds of the educated Europeans of the period, and contemporary publications treated architecture in terms of history, practice, and theory. Among the paintings in Bertin's collection, and in relevant archival documents, there is a remarkable amount of information about architecture. The Jesuits were aware that there was no comprehensive European study of Chinese architecture, despite the long-standing contacts between the two civilizations. What the missionaries ultimately provided were paintings that would be bound in two truly extraordinary volumes that sought for the first time to present the totality of Chinese architecture. The albums bear the title, Essay sur l'architecture chinoise, the essay on Chinese architecture, and they combined dozens of highly detailed illustrations with captions and longer texts. Taking their cue from the European Enlightenment point of view that sought accurate knowledge of technology, the elements of construction, and the arts alongside historical traditions, the French Jesuits prepared detailed descriptions dated 3 October 1773 to accompany the paintings commissioned especially for Bertin. The first album, of the essay contains some 135 paintings. 
It begins with a short avertissement, an introduction, and facing each painting, there was a caption drawn from the 1773 descriptions. The second volume follows the same format. It contains 53 paintings, a somewhat longer introduction that seeks to clarify important elements of Chinese architecture that are distinctly different from European architecture, along with captions or brief text facing each painting. And at the very end, a short article which contains, and I quote, several observations that deserve our attention, end quote. The illustrations throughout the essay include buildings for all classes of society, from the common people, represented by only a few illustrations, to the literati, and most especially imperial constructions, including many in the Imperial Garden Palace, the Yuan Yuan. A group of 11 paintings in the second volume of the essay present something truly novel, views of Chinese interiors. The Jesuit missionaries remarked that no doubt a long text explaining the different customs and taste of the Chinese, and even the effects of weather on the arrangement of interiors would be much appreciated. But for the moment, one must rely on the pictures to tell the story. Three of the interiors are given the same title, ceremonial and audience hall in the home of an imperial prince. The second painting of the three, the painting we're looking at here, shows a reception room furnished with the accessories of a Chinese scholar. One detail is worth noting. On the wall at the right is a landscape painting in ink flanked by cal a calligraphic couplet that hangs behind a table with a bundle of books, a bronze incense burner, and a red porcelain vase. We will see that Bertin received an illustration of just such an arrangement of calligraphy and objects to be recreated as his estate at Chateau. In addition to his cabinet chinois in Paris, after his retirement from public office, Bertin also planned authentic Chinese constructions, a studio and gardens at his residence at Chateau, west of Paris. For the architectural details, he consulted with the missionaries in Beijing and Father Joseph-Marie Amiot, one of Bertin's most prolific correspondents, wrote that he envisioned Bertin there as a kind of Chinese literatus, the Confucian ideal embodied in the scholar officials of the Qing court. Along with a letter dated 16 October 1790, Amio sent several crates containing decorative objects, as well as a painting illustrating how Bertin might arrange part of his Chinese studio, the painting we see here. It details the character Fu at the top, meaning good fortune, and includes a horizontal signboard with a four-character motto for Bertin's studio, Zhengzi Bu Qing, which Amio translates as, and I quote, a sage is not an instrument. The phrase is a quotation from the Analects of Confucius, and it means that a true scholar is not a simple tool, but rather someone ready for all things. The two vertical scrolls form a couplet emphasizing the virtues of the Chinese sage that Bertin should emulate. Amio's notes on the painting also describe the implements for burning incense on the table. Although he may have completed some of the gardens in Chinese style, it is unlikely that Bertin succeeded in constructing any Chinese building before the seizure and dispersal of his collections in the wake of the French Revolution. A document entitled Atlas de la Seigneurie de Chateau was compiled on Bertin's orders in 1780. It contains detailed maps carefully rendered in color. We are looking <clears throat> at a tale of the map that illustrates Bertin's personal properties. The map does not show Bertin's chateau itself, the residence designed by Jacques Germain Soufflot, one of the most important and influ influential architects of the day, which was located in the space between the village of Chateau and what is relative, relevant to the discussion here, the area that appears to be a less formal garden in the Anglo-Chinese style on the banks of the River Seine. The map also shows Nymph, Soufflot's Nymphaeum, little tail you can see up here, a central element of Bertin's gardens in the narrow terrace facing the Seine. These parts of the garden are not labeled, and it is difficult to accurately identify them from the atlas map. However, one section in this part of the garden, adjacent to a hexagonal site with a small structure in the center, being about this part down here, <clears throat> appears to be an elaborate rockwork or possibly a grotto, which would be a typical feature of a late 18th century garden in the Chinese style. 
There is no evidence on this map, however, of the elaborate Chinese-style constructions that were so carefully described in the documents Bertin sent to Father François Bourgeois, the administrator of the French mission in Beijing. The exchange was based on Bertin's requests for authentic Chinese architectural designs and perhaps the collaboration of a Chinese architect. One document from Bertin's lifetime, however, appears to describe a Chinese-style garden feature, possibly the rockworks that appear on the Atlas map, emulating similar constructions of natural rocks forming artificial mountains in Chinese gardens. On 26 May 1778, John Adams, who would serve as the second president of the United States, spent the day with Benjamin Franklin and Franklin's grandson on a visit to Bertin's chateau and gardens. Adams' diary entry for the day briefly describes the pleasant carriage rides through the countryside from Paris to Chateau, but his description of the gardens is, frankly, dismissive. And I quote, He showed his luxury, as he called it, which was a collection of misshapen rocks at the end of this garden, drawn together from great distances at an expense of several thousands of guineas. I told him I would sell him a thousand times as many for half a guinea. Who knew John Adams had a sense of humor? Bertin sold the chateau in 1790 and departed France, eventually the spa in Belgium, where he died on 16 September 1792. The property passed to various owners before its final demolition in 1910. We were looking here at a photograph reproduced on a card, postmarked 1910, entitled La Goite du Chateau, which shows the nymphaeum from the island in the Seine opposite Bertin's estate. Part of the dilapidated facade of the chateau, where the shutters closed or half open, appears in the trees behind the nymphaeum, which is itself the only part of the estate still extant. Bertin's gardens, as laid out in the Atlas map, would have been to the right of the chateau in this photograph. I would like to conclude with a consideration of what I have referred to as the translation of images. One truly ex unique example of these translations is the Sèvres Royal Porcelain Vase we are looking at here on the left, the so-called Vase Japon, now in the Frick Collection here in New York. Among the books that had been sent by Father M. Yeo were the volumes of the Qin Ding, Xi Qin Gu Jian, the Imperially Commissioned Investigation of Antiquities in the, Imper excuse me, in the Inner Palace, received in 1767. This illustrated catalog of the Qing Imperial Collection of Ancient Bronzes contains woodblock illustrations followed by texts briefly describing the bronzes. One of the illustrations, which we see here on the right, depicts a vessel entitled Zhou Dynasty, ringed-handled ve ringed vessel, Yo, number six. Bertin wrote to the Jesuits in 1774, noting his regrets there was no one to interpret the uses of such vases which he assumes is contained in the text that accompanies each illustration. Then he continued, and I quote, I have produced this year two of these vases in the royal manufactory. They were very much appreciated by the court, and the king made a present to one of his grandchildren, end quote. In 1774, Bretagne had just been appointed director of the royal manufactory at Sèvres, and he held this administrative position until 1780. The vase Japon is exceptional in that it differs markably, markedly from the royal manufactory's chinoiserie productions, the form and decorations of which invoke a fanciful vision of China. The vase Japon resets, represents an attempt by the Sev manufactory to produce something that appears authentically Chinese, even including the chain link handle illustrated in the Qing Imperial woodcut. But such direct imitations of ancient vessels were not common practice until the 19th century. Bertin's commission for the Vase Japon is truly an extraordinary example of the translation of a Chinese image into European form. Today, I have only been able to touch on a few of the issues raised by Bertin's engagement with China, and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, for this wonderfully rich presentation. Uh, we will hold on to the question until the end. Our second speaker, Christos Mantek, 
is Associate Professor of Art History in the Department of Architecture at MIT. Her research focuses on 18th century European graphite and decorative arts in their transcultural context. Professor Smantek's many publications include Rococo Exotic, French Mounted Porcelain and the Allure of the East, 2007, Mariette and the Science of the Connoisseur in 18th century Europe, 2014. She was the co curator of a splendid exhibition, Dare to Know Prints and Drawings in the Art in the Age of Enlightenment, recently on view at the Harvard Art Museum and co-editor of its accompanying catalog, which was selected as the New York Times Best Art Book of 2022. She's currently completing a monograph, Disorient, Arts from China in 18th Century France, and her talk today is drawn from this new project. Welcome, Crystal. <laughs> Thank you very much um, for the introduction, for the invitation to be here. I'm really delighted to be here. And I have to say that it's a real pleasure to be um, sharing the podium with John Finley, who is a friend and a generous colleague of several years and from whom I have learned um, so much. So for my part of our um, duet, I'm going to continue our focus on Henri Leonard Bertin um, by discussing one little known album sent to him by the French Jesuits in Beijing. Titled Idoles Chinoises, or Chinese Idols, that album features 25 paintings on silk of Sino Tibetan Buddhist emblems. And my interest in this album is twofold. On the one hand, it exemplifies the truly exceptional items that Bertin received from Beijing. On the other, it can help us to recapture the disorientations that imports from China elicited among 18th century Europeans. From the 1670s, as European trade with the Qing Empire accelerated, France was flooded with objects from Asia, objects whose technologies, materials, and motifs challenged European understanding. So the first part of my talk will focus on the album itself as one unusual example of the variety of works from China encountered by French viewers. And in the second part of my talk, I turn to the French phenomenon of mounting Asian porcelains in French gilt bronze, a genre of 18th century decorative art that amalgamates Chinese and French ingenuity, and that has fascinated me for some time. In 18th century France, as in Qing China, interpersonal contacts between French and Chinese subjects were rare. Things rather than people were the principal vectors of Sino-European encounter. And it was thus through the display of imports and the design of new objects in response to them that French artists and consumers negotiated the attractions and the anxieties generated by China and the pleasures and disorientations of its art. So first, the, the album. So here is a view of the so-called Chinese idols uh, that Bertin received. And um, all of the photos you're seeing of this album are thanks to John. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, now housed in the print department of the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, we know that this album arrived in France by 1771 when it appears in a manuscript list of items received by Bertin from Beijing in 1770 and 1771. Now the confusions of this album for its European viewers began even before it was opened and its unfamiliar imagery revealed. The paintings are housed in a Chinese accordion or concertina binding, a format which compels the viewer not only to open it in a manner to which European audiences were unaccustomed, but also to read as it were from right to left, as is customary in Asia. So you would lift the album, you would lift the cover rather, uh, and the cover would turn to the right. And you can't see it here, but the album's covers are bound in bright yellow silk um, with a floral pattern. So here, here once we've lifted and turned to the right um, is the first opening. And as here, each of the album's 25 paintings are finely executed in ink and color on fairly dark blue silk and are mounted on bright yellow paper. 
and each album page is inscribed with a caption in Chinese characters and a number. So the num sorry. The numbers, the captions are there and then the numbers are below. So this is one and this is two. So the numbering on the folios adheres to the overall right to left orientation of the album, which to a European viewer was as defamiliarizing as the Sino-Tibetan Buddhist images the album contains. If the figure on the right, for example, would likely be somewhat legible to European viewers, the painting on the left must have been baffling. And this unfamiliarity was something the Beijing Jesuits who sent the album sought to mitigate, at least to some degree. The Jesuits included a six-page manuscript with the album, which is still extant, and which included a key to the images to which the numbers on each page of the album correspond. So here are the first um, three openings of the album um, with the corresponding entries in the manuscript which the Jesuits sent and which I've transcribed here and in the following slides. And those of you who are familiar with this image, we will recognize right away that there are some mistakes in the Jesuits' um, titling of these images. But I've kept the titles because that is how a French viewer would come to understand the images. So, but just by way of example, number one, sorry, Number one, which is this one, um, the Jesuits translated as Buddha of the South when it uh, translates as something different, so the male Buddha. And this, the number two, which is this one, the Jesuits translate as three celestial peaches, but there are, the, the Chinese caption reads three treasures. So beyond these short titles and a brief explanation that the lotus flower seed pods on which all the emblems rest also relate to Buddhism, the Jesuits offer no interpretation of the meanings of these works. They do, however, discuss the exceptional provenance of this album. They identify it as having come from the palace or the forbidden city in Beijing and the images it contains as having formerly hung in an imperial temple. According to the Jesuits, the images were apparently once part of a larger painting in which the 25 individual paintings were arranged in a five by five format, uh, like a checkerboard, that's their description. But since it would have been too unwieldy to send to Berta in its original configuration, the Jesuits had the images separated and bound into what they called a cahier chinois or a folded paper format. And the quality of the paintings, their iconography, and the yellow page mounts and yellow silk cover support the Jesuits' claim of an imperial provenance. Although the Jesuits don't explain it, the album's images depict the seven royal treasures, which include the, em includes the emblems you see on the screen, the eight auspicious symbols of Buddhism, and offerings of the five senses. And here, here are the next um, four openings of the album. And here you see some of the eight auspicious symbols, including, including paired fish, um, the treasure vase, um, the endless knot, um, the parasol, um, and others. So the segmented painting we see here may well have been produced by artists working in the Hall of Rectitude complex, the center of Tibetan Buddhism within the Forbidden City, and which from the 1690s was dedicated to sutra recitation and the production of religious paintings and objects for imperial use. And indeed, the representation of these painted emblems on their lotus pedestals is very close in style to several extant freestanding imperial Buddhist altar emblems produced for the Chenlung Emperor, who ruled from 1735 to 1796. So here are the next openings. Nothing of what I've just described, though, would have been known to Bertin and other 18th century French viewers of the album. For them, the album's contents must have alternated between the inscrutable and the recognizable, between bronze vessels, flowers, shells, and other emblems which become partially legible only because of the Jesuit's key. And an example would be um, this image here, which the uh, <clears throat> Jesuits helpfully identified as a mirror. But if the images and their meanings were opaque for French viewers, 
The shadowless, flat tint technique and the colors used for these paintings were almost certainly of interest to Berta and his colleagues. In 1776, the preface to the first volume of the Memoirs Concernant les Chinois, the publication spearheaded by Berta, which John discussed in his talk, readers were advised that any judgment of Chinese painting should be based not on Canton trade works, but rather on paintings from Beijing. Uh, quote, paintings from Beijing where the drawing is of astonishing exactitude and the colors have a vivacity which we have not yet been able to attain. Coming directly from the Qing Palace, the album of Chinese idols exemplified Chinese painting in a way that works from Canton could not. The album's images feature qualities we know Bertin and his collaborators appreciated in other paintings sent from Beijing. The beauty and meticulousness of paintings on silk, a support not used for painting in Europe. The very fine straight lines Chinese artists achieved with brushes rather than with pens as would be customary in Europe and the vibrant color fast blues of Chinese painting, unmatched in European production, that were extolled by Bertin's fellow Sinophile, the Duc de Chol. Excuse me. <clears throat> Motivated by his first-hand encounters with Chinese paintings from Beijing, Scholl himself experimented with painting on silk, and in 1781 sought to determine the chemical composition of blue pigments from China. He reported his results to the French Academy of Science in 1781 and later in a short publication in 1783. And for his experiments with Chinese blue, he worked with some of the drawings of Chinese architecture that John discussed in his talk and which Bertin lent to the Duke for this purpose. So here are the final three um, album pages. And they again offer points of connection to French viewers as is the case with the stringed instrument on the left. And simultaneously, as with the other two representations, the meaning eludes their, uh, excuse me, eludes European understanding. Potentially appreciated for their technique and use of color by some of their French viewers, these de depictions were also, it must be acknowledged, framed negatively from the start as idolatrous. For the Jesuits who sent the paintings, the emblems, or to use their language, the idols they represented, were emanations of the worship of false gods and of practices the Jesuits variously described in their manuscript note as, quote, extravagant, obscure, and delirious. The note is shot through with hostility to Buddhism, uh, Catholicism's rival belief system in China, and it's a very useful reminder that the reception of Asian imports by 18th century Europeans was shaped as much by religious considerations as by aesthetics. The Beijing Jesuits struggled to reconcile their admiration for the Chenlong Emperor with his Buddhist beliefs, a struggle they expressed in blunt terms when they sent the album, and I'm quoting from their accompanying manuscript note. Quote, the emperor is as much a great prince and a man of genius in matters of politics and of governance as he is an automaton and stupid in matters of idolatry and superstition. In a similarly harsh assessment of Buddhism at the Qing court published in the Memoir Concernant les Chinois in 1783, one of the Beijing Jesuits asked, and I'm quoting again, how to reconcile such stupid conduct with the sublimity of their politics, their philosophy, and their genius. Turning then to a brief discussion of the figures and ritual objects in Buddhist temples, the same Jesuit writes of his astonishment, and quoting again, that the Chinese who are naturally wise and decent would suffer such risable idols in their temples. Turning now from the album to French decorative arts objects produced in response to imports from China, I wonder if a similar um, questioning, though clearly on a different register, can be traced in mounted porcelains. And though the practice of mounting precious objects had a long history of Europe, as it did in China, the practice of fitting Asian porcelain in elaborate and often elevated gilt bronze mounts was a peculiarly French phenomenon that persisted from decades, excuse me, four decades, 
from the 1720s to the 1790s and then was revived again in the 19th century. It was a practice that often radically transformed the porcelains, allowing simultaneously for the salvaging, or we might say the upcycling, of valuable but damaged porcelains by concealing the damage, and the transformation of unfamiliar forms into more familiar ones. And on the screen, I was showing you one of the most common conversions in which a Chinese ceramic is transformed into a potpourri uh, through the addition of, a, of handles and a pierced um, gilt collar. And here, a photograph of the potpourri disassembled that gives a sense of the artisanal labor and skill required, and with it, a sense of the considerable cost of such an object. Many mounted porcelains rivaled and even exceeded the prices paid for old master paintings in 18th century France. Um, more unusual and fascinating to me still, many years after having first seen it, is this um, openwork Chinese porcelain dating to the 15th or 16th century. And this is a notably early date for an imported Chinese porcelain. And I should note too that these are two views of the same object, right? This is one object seen in, from two different um, points of view. So this porcelain has been expertly fitted with 18th century French gilt bronze leafy branches, which seem to defy the inertness of metal as they organically weave around and through the porcelain's textured surface. There's something, there's something very tactile about these branches. Um, they alternately conceal and highlight the object at once framing it and containing it, kind of fixing it into place. An object like this evidence is an appreciation of Asian porcelain and glaze technology and by association <clears throat> of the purportedly materially splendid empire from which it came. At the same time, the gilt bronze mounts suggest a questioning of the vessel's form and its aesthetic. If porcelain, according to a 17th century Portuguese commentator, was, quote, the most beautiful thing man has invented, why use it for such a non seemingly non-functional form? And yet, confounding as the ceramic might have been to a European viewer, it was worth commissioning a bespoke, costly mount for it and displaying it in an elite French interior. Um, and I, I would like to see a similar um, questioning embodied in this remarkable inkstand, uh, recently acquired by the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston. How to reconcile the form of China's so-called idols, Buddhist and otherwise, with the Qing Imperium's technological superiority, wise government, and moral exemplarity. Assembled about 40 years after the object um, we just saw, this one emulates in gilt bronze the lotus flower pedestal of Buddhist imagery, which here rises from choppy gilt bronze water to support the Taoist twin laughing immortals of harmony and union. And down below, three porcelain shells wittily float on the surface of the water below, or on the water. Buddhist imagery had circulated in Europe well before Bertin received the album of emblems from Beijing in the early 1770s. And in this object uh, in Houston, we have a literal example of how Chinese devotional imagery informed the design of at least one French mounted porcelain. The print on the right of Pusa or Guan Yin, the Bodhisattva of Compassion, is from Athanasius Kircher's China Illustrated with Monuments. <clears throat> excuse me, first published in 1667, and Kirchhoff's print is clearly based on a prototype from Asia, which it emulates quite closely, and it was subsequently uh, reproduced in other 18th century texts. And it was also not the only printed image of Guan Yin to circulate in Europe, and here's another from Engelbert Kemper's History of Japan, first published in 1727, which is representative of the Asian source material the mount designer seems to have sought out around 1780. So in this assemblage, the religious iconographies of China are knowingly transformed into an expensive luxury object of the kind that helped to consolidate the historical othering of Asians, as Qi Ming Yang, Meredith Martin, and others have persuasively argued. 
And this is an othering whose repercussions continuing into our present day, I do not wish to minimize. At the same time, as the art historian Christopher Wood has recently, has recently written, I'm quoting, parody is by no means an unmixed expression of disdain. It is often the inverted indicator of envy. He writes further that 18th century European responses to Chinese imports, and I'm quoting again, could be understood as a defensive, parodic reaction to the threatening authority and sophistication of the Chinese tradition. Sino-French objects like mounted porcelains are suggestive of a spectrum of responses to Asian imports and to the distant and powerful empire from which they came. This was an empire which 18th century Europeans could not readily dismiss and which, like the objects it produced, elicited admiration, imaginative identification, uncertainty, mockery, and deep ambivalence. Qing China was an unquestionably civilized polity, a modern economic power possessed of an antiquity verifiably more antique than Europe's. And though they did not always readily acknowledge it, 18th century Europeans were well aware that China had priority in the invention of paper, printing, and the compass. China's vibrant, lasting pigments and many of its ceramic glazes could not be replicated in Europe, and porcelain itself had remained China's coveted technological secret for centuries. China was, I would like to suggest, both disorienting and destabilizing at a historical moment when European hegemony in East Asia was not yet entrenched. One could respond to the exemplarity of China with denigration, as many 18th century French commentators did, with wit, or as Bertin was exceptionally able to do by gathering information and, gather and engaging in industrial espionage on the ground with the help of his Jesuit informants in Beijing. Each approach in its own way tacitly acknowledged that neither France nor Europe were at the center of the 18th century world. If we are serious about decentering Europe from our historical narratives, then the decorative arts can, I think, help us to see how in the 18th century China did just that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Crystal, for this so stimulating talk. Um, shall we move to the round table? I have a couple of questions, then I will open the floor for the audience. Um, I'm really interested in the power of image in this time, in conveying and establishing the knowledge system. I wonder if uh, either of you can talk about this and how the task project of compiling, compiling this large groups of images and mostly semi-scientific drawings um, tied to the French Enlightenment project. And also, if you see the comparative aspect in China at the same time, in the Qing court, uh, the emperor was also engaged in large scale project of compiling images. And Qianlong Emperor sponsored this series of uh, manuals of beasts, manuals of birds, and also the illustrated the regulations of uh, imperial ritual ritual objects, which also included the mostly Western objects. Um, so at the same time, in two parts of the world, um, from very different passes, and this uh, fascination with uh, images in conveying knowledge. For best of the yeah. Uh, Bertrand believed, and other people at the time believed, that pictures told as good a story, as reliable a story, provided as reliable information as a printed text would, and that sometimes pictures provided a great deal more information than could be written down. Whenever uh, Bertin received something that was accompanied with a book or drawings or paintings, uh, often enough, the only thing that he would note on the document was, voyez les peintures, see the paintings, which means that there were pictures that came along with it. And if we're lucky, we have both the pictures and the documents. Often enough, not, unfortunately. There's a lot of stuff that's disappeared. But uh, still, there, there was a belief that pictures told a, uh, as, as accurate or detailed a story as a text could, often more so, more so. 
when the Jesuits, as I said, I, I put it with a little bit of it, the Jesuits would write, well, we're, you know, sending as much as we can right now. If you have questions, um, in some cases, they said, we didn't keep a copy of the drawing, so make a quick sketch and ask us about that, that particular drawing, and we'll provide more information for you. But right now, we're going to let the pictures do the talking. Yeah, I can't, I can't speak to what's happening in Beijing in the 18th century, but in, you know, in 18th century Europe, right, images are very highly prized as having, being more transparent to the object they depict than text. And it's interesting in this regard that Gao and Yang were given lessons in drawing, right, to help them. When and in etching of all things. And etching, yes, which is very interesting. Go figure. But precisely to fulfill this, their their mandate, which was to convey as much information as they could. And Bertin, I don't, I don't remember what he says exactly, but it's very explicit that we need images to be able to do this. And there's also, of course, the linguistic divide that is circumvented by, or was thought to be circumvented by, by images. Um, I'm also wondering about um, the Jesuit missionaries' roles in mediating these exchanges. It seems that they played extremely important roles and in selecting what types of images and also in commissioning. Um, do we know more about their system of uh, ordering, selecting, and commissioning? Um, we already mentioned that tension of uh, religions that played really important roles in that, uh, which may result in some deliberate mistranslation or avoiding deeper explanation. Uh, I wonder if either of you can talk more about just missionaries wrote in this project? I honestly don't know. Um, Bertin asked for specific things. Uh, as I say, a lot about architecture. Um, but for other ones, why the Jesuits would send him a particular text, uh, I honestly don't know. I mean, the things that they, they made the choices themselves, I think. They chose things that uh, they thought that he would be interested in or that would be uh, interesting in France. But I can't think of anything where somebody says, oh, maybe you should uh, learn about rice cultivation, or maybe you should learn about uh, this side of the other thing. There was um, lots of seeds and uh, were sent because Bertin was also very much interested in agriculture. So they were trying to help get you know Chinese plants growing in France. He um, oh, was also interested in tea. Tea was uh, described for its uh, medicinal properties. And there's other texts about that, but I can't think of anything where there's like they're specifically saying, oh, we think that you should really know this because you don't know it yet, but it's going to be fascinating to you. I think maybe it's a, the background assumption, um, but I honestly can't say. I don't know. There, there is a sense from their letters that they're exasperated by demands for from Bertin. And in the case of the album of the Sino-Tibetan um, imagery, they're clearly responding to a request for more information about belief practices in China. Uh, so they're, they're fulfilling, you know, what I, I would say on the reading of the manuscript that comes with it, unhappily fulfilling this, you know, mandate. Um, and they, they didn't mention them in the talk, but they sent along with the album, um, a printed, I think, set of sutras that were offered to Guan Yin. I haven't been able to identify it. Um, so this, you know, how they got it, why they sent it. They're not very explicit on why they sent it, but they're really not willing to talk about what these images might represent. And as I, you know, you've heard from the, you know, language used in the manuscript, know that they are not appreciative, shall we say, of, of Buddhism. Um, so they're clearly responding. They say in this note, as they do many times, right, in the letters, you know, we don't have time, <laughs> like you said, the pictures will have to do the work. And in the case of the um, Tibet, Sino-Tibetan um, album, they say, you know, we couldn't possibly do this. You know, there's too many, you know, in, I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not a specialist in Buddhism, but there's too, the gods take too many variations and, you know, there's hundreds of them and we can't possibly do this. And occasionally one reads in their letters of like, you're asking too much. Like we are here to proselytize and we're not here to, you know, do your intelligence gathering. Um, but it doesn't answer your question, right? Like to what, to what degree, you know, were they being very selective about what they sent? I would say in the case of the album, they're sending 
this material, not because they want to, but because they have a benefactor who is supporting the mission and eventually does support the mission when the Jesuits are suppressed worldwide. So there's an interest on their part too. Um, yeah, it appears that they are very closely involved with the, the Empress sponsorship as well, this set of image you showed with data from the court. So maybe for the further research, um, we can see if um, their project had this also impact for the Tinkor's art production, and maybe this idea of compiling images and commissioning this particular style of images had an effect in Tinkor's arts and culture, and that would be really interesting. The only effect I can think of in that way is that when the French uh, gifts arrived, the tapestries were too big for any building that the Qianlong Emperor had, and uh, so he built a new construction, European style, attached to the Yuan Yuan, specifically to display the tapestries. Uh, most of the Western material that got sent to China ended up in that particular building. But he originally, if a court, he originally, he'd ordered a set of tapestries. He never got them. Well, I was going to mention something different. No. That when Qianlong was presented with the tapestries, the Jesuits, you know, report back to Bertin that he was initially going to hang them in a temple. Oh, yes. <laughs> and then supposedly he wouldn't do that because he knew that it would offend the Jesuits, right, which I think which... is the Jesuits inserting their attitude into the story. Yeah, like I often wondered, you know, how much they are, you know, crafting the truth in the letters that, and it's particular around the tapestries, but they have an extra line. Um, That's for sure. Let's take questions from the audience, please. Um, just a second, they have a microphone for me. Oh, I see. Sorry. So uh, I just wanted to comment real fast that it's interesting that it's Jesuits uh, because out of all the Christian uh, groups, they probably are the mo were the most open towards um, uh, preserving and being knowledgeable about the culture. Um, and they clearly are, yeah. right? They, they're very knowledgeable. Um, maybe selectives, you know, what they're willing to, in what they're willing to divulge about what they know. That's how I read the, you know, accompanying manuscript to the album. There are limits to how far they're willing to go, and Buddhism was one of the limits. Yeah, this is my interpretation. It would be interesting to know what you know. Know what I know? Yes. <laughs> Can I be frank? This is very new territory for me, <laughs> the, the the Buddhist dimension. But it's you know it's humbling to work on this and material, and, and especially that um, album that they put together. What a great achieve achievement to have the paintings on silk uh, mounted on paper. The colors are exquisite. Yes, they are. I, it says a lot. But here, but here, I wonder too. Right? There's there's a tension in that account that they send along with it. On the one hand, it comes from the palace. On the other, they put it together. They put it together in a format that's typical for Buddhist albums. I, you know, I, I don't know that they put it together. They say they did, but they also say it comes from the palace. Like it's very, it's a little ambiguous, but it's a, it is absolutely beautiful. It's the, mo it's a stunning album. I just, I just wonder, you know, but how did they put it together or was it, you know, how did they come? Well, yes, that's a very interesting question. How did they come by it if they didn't put it together? Even if they did put it together, how did they, how did they, come by the painting. Yeah, it's like a little snapshot of something just to give them and be satis satisfied with. Yeah, Freya has a question. Thank you both um, and Nime for this. It's really fascinating to, to see this interchange. Um, I'm trying to formulate my question and I'm still sort of working it out, but I think um, sort of between what you've both said about uh, the, the way that images work and also, um, Jeffrey was just saying to me, you know, this was so many mysterious and celestial, right? That this notion of a kind of inscrutable mysticism, I wonder if you have thought about this or if there's evidence that that was in a sense played up 
by the French and then this sense of kind of mysterious, you know, there's this kind of mysteriousness that we can't penetrate. And then I guess my, my sort of, uh, pendant question to that is also whether there's any sense of kind of identifying a parallel mysticism in, in Catholic tradition. I mean, because we're not talking about Protestantism, right? There is certainly a, a kind of a mysticism embedded in Catholicism that, um, you know, I wonder if there's kind of a, a parallel thought about that. Like, well, you know, there's, there's no way that we can, there's no way that we can understand this. We have to look at the images. We have to kind of experience this. And it's not about really understanding it through, you know, reason or words. And I'm just curious if that's something that you've worked well, around. Maybe just very briefly. Um, I did, I was going to make a claim about, you know, the continuous or the, the frequent use of mysterious in the captions. And I thought, oh, you know, this is Mr. Piccino. This is, this is perhaps what you're asking about. But it turns out that's a very common language. That's a very common term in the 18th century to be talking about the Bible, to be talking about the sort of the parts of, you know, belief, Christian belief that are not accessible. So, so I dialed that back. Whenever they talk about Buddhism, they refer to it as idolatry. The, the, the attitudes are very scornful. In the essay sur l'architecture chinoise, there's one section where I think there are like five drawings of uh, pagodas. And in the commentary on it, they say there's nothing worth saying about these buildings because they're just, you know, I, for idols, and that's it. They do talk about one particular one. Um, I think the descriptions of the... Uh, uh, bells hanging from the eaves, from the end of the eaves. You can hear the tinkling. Bertrand himself actually at one point wanted something with bells that tinkled hanging from the eaves. It's one of the things he was sort of imagining in his ha-ha, authentic ha-ha Chinese construction. But the contempt for Buddhism is, is really sort of outstanding. They're much more interested in Confucius, who they saw as a philosopher, which is, of course, a highly loaded 18th century term. Can we start going to start? Oh, My point was going to be exactly that. Um, the image that John showed of Confucius as a child immediately reminded me of Jean-Jacques Rousseau's 1763 book, A Meal or on Education. And perhaps that was a, a something that they could agree on. I mean, obviously it wasn't religion, Christianity, Tibetan Buddhism, you know, never going to meet halfway, but the, but the importance of philosophy during the Ancien regime and the French enlightenment. And then of course the ancient, you know, history of philosophy in China might've been a sort of bonding philosophy or, or a cultural, uh, similarity that, that could be translated as well as of course, the fascination with nature on a more general. The illustrations of the life of Confucius are very European adaptations of a uh, Chinese woodblock uh, illustrated life of Confucius, but had something like 120 images in it or something. I can't remember now, but it was a reasonably well-known series. Uh, Hillman got better and better at doing this as he went along and taking these illustrations, taking something that's completely Chinese, it's totally flat, no perspective, no light, no shadow, uh, whatever, and transforming it into a European style design so that there's really very little of China left in it. Um, if you see the originals that he worked from, it's often very difficult to sort of connect the two pictures because he so completely transformed it. And he, he was also making money out of it. I mean, he was a very successful publisher because he published his own version of the life of Confucius, where he tossed in a few more plates that he'd engraved, probably paid for by Bertin's nickel. Can I just add to that? Um, there's evidence that the album of, um, that I was discussing was, was supposed to be published in the memoir um, Concernant les Chinois, because it's the manuscript, because the manuscript is housed separately from the album, is in a section of the editor's um, notes that says to be included in the memoir from volume 13 forward. Volume 13, maybe you have this at your fingertips, I don't, but it's late 1780s. Um, 
it never I it never appears, but one wonders, you know, one assumes they were gonna illustrate it. And so one wonders, you know, how you know, if Hellman had was going to be the translator of these images, what they might have looked like. Hard to guess. It would probably look like a, Ch a French face more than a uh, Chinese ritual object. I'm afraid we have time for only one more question. So, Daniel. All right. Well, thank you so much for a wonderful uh, evening. Really fascinating material. And there's a lot more yet to be learned from going through all these documents. But I have a quick question. The French sent the best of their luxury goods, tapestries and sap or porcelain. Do the Jesuits write at all how these objects were received? Other that the tapestries yes. were too Absolutely. large for any Absolutely. building? They said the emperor and the officials of the court were deeply impressed by them and thought that they were really beautiful and, and quite amazing. Uh, they um, were presented to the emperor and he was just said, oh, oh, the very best, which is why he wanted to hang the tapestries and ended up building an entire palace building to put them in because he was so impressed by the quality of them. But but at the same time, it, it's always effusive, right? That whoever received the Sevres in Beijing loved it. You know, he loved the tapestries and he did in fact build a building for them, right? So and that, that's not in question. But that's another dimension of the correspondent who's going to who's going to correct them right it's traveled ha the letter has traveled halfway around the globe and if the jesuits say you know of course all of these french luxury goods were loved and appreciated maybe they were right it's just it's always positive there is never right there is never a negative assessment of something sent to the not something from europe no, no. that's it <laughs> Well, I thank you for this really inspiring session. Thank you. And then also thank you to our public humanities team, Andrew Kircher, Nadia Rivers, and Lara Misty, and our student assistants for making this possible. Thank you.